have a Bible with you this morning, I'd like to invite you to open it to the book of 1 Corinthians. And the song said we feel refreshed. How many of you say that this morning, you feel refreshed with God? One of you? I'll be the first one to tell you that... Uh, the more I think about church and the more I think about what we do for God and the, the places we go and, uh, you know, I, I see a lot of people. And as a, as a pastor, I, I still work a full-time job, so I get to see people there. I have a family, so I have my family to take care of. And then at church, and those are the three basic things that I do. I don't think I do anything much past that too much. Um, but I, life is good, don't get me wrong. I'm blessed, but I see a lot of people who, who are not happy. I see a lot of people who are born again believers who struggle, who lack the joy that I believe God has designed you for. And God wants you to have that joy in your heart. He wants you to have his joy inside you because you're saved. If you've, if you've believed in him, if you've accepted him, you're, you're born again, and he wants that joy to be on the inside of you. He wants that joy to overflow from you and flow out onto others. But this world is so set against us, against the Christians. It's so set against anything that we do. It's hard to find that joy and display that joy in this world. And I can understand that. And I understand, look, times are tough on everybody. Financially, it's tough on everybody. You know, uh, groceries are just, I cannot believe how expensive food is. It's just amazing. And that makes, and that, and that makes a, a damper on you, if you will. When it costs so much to live and you make, most of you like me, so little. <laughs> you know, and it just seems like it takes everything you make just to survive. I can see where that would just, where this world just sucked the life out of you. But God wants you to have joy inside you. And, and what he wants for you is to share that joy. And we have to display that joy in order to share it. I want to share with you a passage out of the book of 1 Corinthians. And this is uh, verse 26 through 29. And it says this, Remember, dear brothers and sisters, that few of you are, were wise in the world's eyes or powerful or wealthy when God called you. Instead, God chose things the, the world considers foolish in order to, to shame those who think they are wise. And he chose things that, are, that were powerless to shame those who are powerful. God chose things despised by the world, things counted as nothing at all, and used them to bring to nothing what the world considers important. As a result, no one can ever boast in the presence of God. I, wanna, I just want to share with you this morning, look, you're not too good for God, first and foremost. You are who you are, you're who God made you, God designed you for his purpose. All right, And what we need to realize is this, this world... Is trying so hard to tear Jesus away from you. And we're just kind of cruising right along with it. And not really even, even standing up for what we believe in. Do you realize that they, they try so hard to prove all this stuff. Look, I don't have to prove anything to you. I don't have to prove anything to them. All I have to know is what I believe in. Because if I believe in God and I believe in, that he died for my sins. If I believe that he was crucified for me and he rose again. I, the Bible says I'm saved. If I accept him into my life, then I'm saved. I confess it with my mouth. And yes, we're all sinners. We all fall short. But this world is dead set against what God wants for you. And I want you to see that this morning. And I want to show you that through the eyes of David. If you would turn with me back to the book of 1 Samuel. I want to tell you a little bit about Israel. Okay? Israel uh, was at a time of Judges. And there were times where they set judges up over all these little areas and they were the ruler of that little area and all these judges come together and they collectively ruled Israel, okay? Well, at this time, Samuel had grown old and he, he appointed his sons to be judges over Israel. Now, Joel and Abijah, his oldest sons, held court in, now I love this word because it's, in, in here it's Beersheba, but if you go down the road, it's Beersheba, okay? So this is the one in Israel. But they were not like their father. They were greedy for money and they accepted bribes and perverted justice. Okay? It was a corrupt system. 
It, it wasn't working. So finally, all the elders of Israel, they met at Ramah uh, to discuss the matter with Samuel. And they said, look, they told him, you are now old and your sons are not like you. Give us a king to judge us like all the other nations have. And the, I'm going to stop right here for just a minute. I want you to look at what they said. Give us a king like all the other nations have. Not what you want for me, God, but what we want what they have. Okay? I want you to see that it was all corrupt. It was all uh, um, the bribes and the, the perverted justice, it says. So Samuel was not happy with their request. It goes on to say in the next verse. And, and so he retreats and, and goes to God and asks God, God, what do I do? Uh, th this is what they're saying. And he says, ever since I brought them uh, uh, from Egypt, God's telling Samuel, they have continually abandoned me and followed other gods. They have not followed along God's plan. They've been doing their own thing this whole time. And now they're giving you the same treatment. He says, look, nothing's changed since I brought them out of Egypt. Okay? Nothing's changed. And listen to what he says. God says this to Samuel. Do as they ask, but solemnly warn them about the way the king will reign over them. Okay? He says, look, give them, give them a king. But he says, I want you to warn them what this king's going to be like. And in the next few verses, you'll find that, verses 10 through uh, 18 there, you'll find that, that God tells them this king's going to take all your stuff. He's going to be a tyrant. He's going to take the best of everything you've got. He's going to take your, your slaves, your sheep, your donkeys, all this stuff. He's going to take your money. Uh, he's going to take the best of everything you have. This, is, this king is going to be a tyrant and rule over you. And so Samuel goes back to the people. And verse 19 says, but the people refused to listen to Samuel's warning. And they said this, even so, we still want a king, they said. We want to be like the nations around us. Our king will judge us and lead us in the battle. So Samuel repeated what the Lord, uh, to the Lord, what the people had said. And the Lord replied, do as they say and give them a king. And then Samuel agreed and he sent the people home. There's a couple of things I want to bring out in that passage. Every since Egypt, or the Israelites were brought through Egypt, they had done things that God did not like. You in your life have done things that God did not like. Okay? All this time, all through time, they're still doing and seeking after the wrong things. All this time, even though they're the Israelites, they're God's chosen people, they were doing the wrong things. And it gets to the point where now they want what the other nations have. Not what God wants for them, but what the other nations have. And they go and they say, go, this is what we want. This is what we want. And God said, look, you still, you're still not listening to me. Is that you this morning? Are you still not listening to God? Because I want you to think about this. The Israelites didn't get it. And that's an example for us. God's given us this example this morning. How long will you be halted between two opinions how long will you say oh i'm a born again believer i'm a child of god, or i go to church and be nowhere near what god wants for you because that's exactly what israel's doing he said do you hear what he said look they put other gods before me what are you putting before god hmm? what are you putting out there that you're you're so enveloped in and it's more important than the god the creator he said give them what they want and they got it too you can read on through history and see all those things that, that happened from this point forward. But I want to talk with you a little bit about David. I want you to know where the Israelites were when all this started with God. They never truly got it right. And my message to you is, is this morning, look, what kind of man or woman do you want to be? You need to get this right. Don't be like the Israelites. Don't be just wishy-washy about everything that comes along. Look, either you're in or you're out. And you need to get this right. So here's David, and I believe David lived on a principle. And David's one of my favorite characters of the Bible. Not, I mean, I have several, but he's one of mine that I really like. But God chose David later, okay, to be king. It wasn't because of David's daddy or his brothers or anything around him. It was because of David. He chose him. Now, David was a shepherd. Shepherds were not wealthy, they weren't even clean most of the time. They stayed out in the fields with the sheep. Can you imagine what that's like? Hmm? Me and Tina was watching a documentary last night. And there was all these sea lions on the beach. She said, look how beautiful that is. I said, can you imagine how that smells? <laughs> there were thousands of them. I mean, it was beautiful, but it sure probably didn't smell good. Shepherds were not the, the uppity of the class. So here is David, little shepherd boy, little teenage boy, out guarding these sheep. And if you were to read a little later in these books of Samuel, you'll see that 
David steps on a battlefield with a giant. Huge man. Trained since he was a little bitty to be a warrior. And here's little teenage David. But before he steps out there, he's talking to the king, and the king puts his armor on him. He said, I, I can't wear this. It doesn't fit. It's not proven. I haven't used it. David said, look, I fought a bear. How many of y'all fought a bear in your lifetime? I don't want to fight a bear. I'll be the first one to tell you. I don't want to get nowhere near a bear. When I go to Gatlinburg, I'm always looking over my shoulder, you know. That's that fear of being eaten alive thing that I have. I'm not, I don't want to fight a bear. But he fought a bear. You know, where they done it with his sling or his fist. I don't care. He fought a bear that come to eat one of his sheep. Hey, that's pretty brave, isn't it? What about the lion? Now, if I don't want to fight a bear, I'm sure I don't even like cats that much. Sorry, Tim. You know, I, I, lion's a lot bigger than a kitty cat. And I sure don't want to fight no lion. And this little teenage boy stepped out on a, a, a field full of sheep and run off a lion. That's pretty brave, isn't it? I think a lot of David, I think that, you know, he done some things that he protected those sheep. He did his job. David wasn't perfect and neither are none of us. But what I want you to see is, look, David was chosen because of his relationship with God. And David had been prepared through life events to be who God wanted him to be. And even though he had to fight those things on the battlefield, you have lions and bears that you have to fight every single day. There's been things happen in your life that you might not have done too well at. You might not have won that battle. You might have, might have hit. What if David had saw that lion? He said, well, I'm going to hide. That thing's huge. He got behind a rock and he let him take a sheep and run off. It, he very easily could have did that, but he didn't. He stood his ground and he, he walked out on that field. That's why when he faced Goliath, he wasn't afraid. He knew God was going to take care of him. He knew God and God knew him. He even told the giant, today is your day to die. My Lord is going to take you for blaspheming him. He's going to take you for, for persecuting him. He's going to take your head. The birds there will eat you. He told this giant, this little boy told this giant that. That we face things on, uh, every single day in the battlefield of life. We have things that oppose us, things that come at us. We have to face them head up. David's a great example right here. Look, just get to the point and do it. There's no Dean Coward behind a rock. Look, if it's meant to be, it is. If God's in it, he'll bring you through it. I know y'all have heard that. We have to be brave. Now, God chose David because David knew God. And he knew who God was, what he was about in his life. And I, I, I couldn't help but ask the question, okay, here we find David. Here we find this little boy. The, the Israelites, historically, you know, they goofed up all through history. I, I, everywhere I read, they just kept turning back to the way other people were and didn't follow God that much. They knew who he was, and they, when they saw the miracles, they went with it. But as soon as the night they got by it, they had to, like, forgetful their memory. They just lost it, and they went right back to the same old things. But the, the people had chosen a king when it comes to David who lived according to God's lifestyle and not the lifestyle of the people around him. When, when David became king, and this is a little bit later in this, when he, he finally becomes king, there's some things about David, yeah, he messes up, but there's some things about him, his spirituality, his humility, his integrity. David was genuine. He was a man after God's own heart. And boy, if that's not an example for us today, should we not be seeking after God with all that we are? Should we not be trying to be as close to God as we can be? He was real. He was humble. And he knew God. These three things, I think, tell us today how we're supposed to be, how, how we're supposed to live. God trains us. David shows us all the things that he did. I, I think of David out in that field and, and all those sheep and the time he had alone with God. When's the last time you just really got alone with God? Just turned the phone, the TV, everything else off, just got out of the door and just got alone with God. David had hours of this. Can you imagine the conversations that God had with David? Can you imagine what that was like? That's why David knew God so well. It's because he had spent time with him. You want to know somebody? Spend some time with them. The truth comes out. You want to know what somebody's like? Invest in them. David invested in God, and in return, God invested in David. I can't think, but uh, uh, I can't help but think of. David, when he was watching those sheep and 
You know, he fought the bear and he fought the lion. He learned to take care of the sheep and he learned to do what he had to do in that time he had with God. But there's some things in that, that being a shepherd, I think we really need to look at this morning. I think one of those is the obscurity of being a shepherd. I assure you, I get bored easy. Is anybody else that way? If I sit for a long time, I get bored. I got to look for something to do. We go to the beach. Tina loves the beach. I'm over there building sand castles. I'm not talking about little castles. I'm talking about ones I can sit in. All right. When we go to the beach, I take a shovel and a bucket, a five-gallon bucket, all right? I get bored, so I have to find something to do. And I can imagine David sitting out there watching those sheep. If it was me, I'd be getting bored. I told him this morning, I'd be painting numbers on the side of them, like the Cerdo sheep, you know, that jumped the... I just, I'd have to find something to do. But David had all this time. He had time with these sheep. But what it gave him was solitude with God, and every day was different. Every day going out with those sheep was different. Every view he saw was different. Sometimes we look at things through our eyes and we see the same thing over and over and over. How many of you get up and go to work, get off, go home? Get up, go to work, get off, go home. Get up, go to work, go home. It's it's monotony. It's the same things over and over and over and over. And we get so used to it, it just becomes a little sidewalk that we travel back and forth. And that's all it is. We miss the beauty in those things because we're not looking at things the way God wants us to. There's the joy. When you have the joy of God inside your heart, you see things that God sees and not just what you see. I guarantee you we miss blessings every single day because we don't stop and take the time to see them. God puts things in our lives for a reason. We're supposed to see them. We're supposed to have that joy in our life. We're supposed to have that smile on our face even though there's a giant on the battlefield with us. We're supposed to. David showed me something this week. No matter how big the obstacle is, my God is bigger. I don't care what kind of giant steps out there on that battlefield. God was bigger than he was. David stepped out there with a sling and five smooth stones. Only needed one of them. One of them. It sunk so far in Goliath's head that it knocked him cold when he hit the ground. David went over and, I don't even see how David picked his sword up, but he picked his sword up and lopped his head off. And it was over. Not only to defeat Goliath, all the Philistine army took off running because it scared them half to death. God can take things that doesn't make any sense in this world and make sense out of it. But we've got to know him. We've got to know who he is and know what he wants. And the only way you can do that is to spend time with God. That's the only way. So says David, the little shepherd boy, the young man who slayed a giant and a bear and a lion, Then we come to that word monotony, the obscurity of everything we see every day. But then we come to that word monotony. And sometimes we need things to be the same. Sometimes we need things to be constant. And the only constant that we have in this life is God. Because he's the same today, tomorrow, and the next day, the next year. He's going to be the same every day. And then we come to the reality of who David really was. This is what I want you to hear this morning. He was the youngest son of Jesse. He was the, the little shepherd boy of Bethlehem. He was the giant killer, the, the, the teenage king that would be the composer of most of the Psalms. King Saul's personal musician for a while. He was Jonathan's friend. He'd become a hunted fugitive, the king of Israel, the father of Solomon. He'd become a champion in battle. Even in his aged years, <clears throat> a troubled monarch. He was... A man of glorious triumph. He was a man of great tragedy. He was uniquely gifted. He was strong in battle, but he was weak at home. See, David knew reality. (coughs) Excuse me. David lived it. Every single day, David lived it, just like you do. It's reality. And the reality is, you are where you are right now because God has put you there. And the reality of that is that you may have things in your life that don't need to be there that you have put there. And maybe you just haven't slowed down enough to give God time in your life. Maybe you haven't got alone with God and and learned who He is and spent time with Him. You see what I'm saying this morning? If you truly want to be happy, you need the joy of the Lord inside. The only way to get that joy is to spend time with God. And to be able to do that, you have to choose to do that. Just like you have to spend time with your wife or your kids 
or anybody else that you know, your neighbor, you have to intentionally choose to do it. And until you do, you may just run in the same rut up and down that little sidewalk I talked about all the time until you finally say, enough is enough. It's the same thing every single day. Enough. God, I choose you. God, I, I want to spend time with you. I want you. So my question is this morning, what will you choose? Will you be like the Israelites and choose all those other things before God and just keep doing the same things over and over and over and never make a change? Oh, I'm a born-again believer. My name's in the Lamb's Book of Life. But you still never did anything for God. You never worked on your relationship. You never built it. Because as far as I know, when, when the judgment comes, there's a little thing that says, step away for I never knew you. Okay? Or come on in, my good and faithful servant, because I knew you. I know who you are. There's more to it than just going through the motions. God wants you to have his joy. He wants you to share that joy. Can you do that? That's the question. Or will you just be like the Israelites were? Because I don't want to be like the Israelites were. I don't want to every three months change around and say, okay, we want this, this, and this instead of this. Oh, I saw the miracles. But I still want what I want because God says look I want you to want what I want my desires to be your desires it's hard it's not easy but you have to choose Would you guys pray with me this morning <clears throat> Father we we just want to pause and everything right now just to stop everything that's around us, all the wheels that are turning, the gears and of life, everything that's just, it's just hindering us. And Father, let us open our hearts right now to you. Father, forgive us of where we are. Forgive us of the things we've messed up. Forgive us of the, where we've sinned. And I know that, that Jesus died on that cross, uh, the one time sacrifice to pay for that. Father, I know we're not perfect. But I know we don't have to be with you. The perfection is in Christ. Father, right here, right now, let us turn to you. Let us be absolute. Let us make the choice and choose you. You are the single most important thing in this world. And we don't have to have proof. Just let us understand and believe. And Father, there may be one in here this morning that has no clue what you can do. Let them see you. There may be some in here that's just living in the rut. Constant monotony. The same things over and over and over. And we think we're climbing out and we just fall back in. Let that change this morning. Father, let them feel your hand upon them, your presence. Father, for those that are just struggling on where to be or what to do, Father, give them a place. Father, give them something that will secure them and what they need to do for you. Father, bear your joy deep down in them. Let it overflow. As we walk out on the battlefields, let us smile. Because these giants that are before us seem so huge. People say it can't be done, but God, I know with you nothing is impossible. Your word says it. Shake this room for you. Shape us, mold us, even if it hurts. Father, there's those that's outside these walls that need you desperately. And how will they hear unless someone tells them? Maybe they just need to see it in us. With us just being not selfish. With us being loving. Father, just giving our, it all for you so that they can see you. Father, make us your reflection this morning. 
make it about you. I'm going to open this altar this morning. Not that I have any power to do that. God is doing it. But it's open right now if you'd like to come and pray. If you'd like to take just a few moments to get along with God. Just talk to Him. He wants to hear your voice. He's calling out. He's reaching out to you. And all you have to do is believe. It's simple as that. It's not complicated. So just tell him where you are and what you need. He already knows, but he wants to hear you say it. What this world says is foolishness. God takes and makes something out of it. That's all the proof I need. Would you come this morning? Would you get on your knees before Almighty God? And just talk and listen. Just come now.